our trajectory of life can be changed if we want to. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is jam-packed with wisdom and takeaways on personal growth, success, and business. This one is definitely a must listen. Our guest today is Rachel Lim. Rachel Lim is the co-founder of Southeast Asia's leading women's wear brand, Love Bonito. Having started the business online at 19 when e-commerce was at its infancy, she revolutionized the spheres of online retail, find the fashion scene in Singapore and grew her blog shop outfit into a multi-million dollar international label. She believes that Love Bonito is not just in the business of fashion, but ultimately in the business of women with the mission to empower the everyday Asian woman. Rachel has headlined at notable international conferences and was honored by Forbes as Asia's 30 under 30 in 2016. She also won Tatler Asia's most influential award for two consecutive years in 2021 and 2020. She welcomed her bundle of joy in December of 2020. Hello, Rachel. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing today? Hello. Good morning. It's morning for me, so I say good I morning. know. It's <laughs> evening for me, morning for you. Yeah. He's in Singapore. <laughs> I'm so glad we made this work. Thank you so much for, you know, um, accommodating to the time. I am I'm feeling really good. How are you? Good. I'm excited for talking to you and meeting you. Like you're such an inspiration. Likewise. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Okay. Why don't you start by telling us your story of how you started Love Bonito? Yeah. So firstly, Love Bonito is one of Asia's largest women's wear brand. Uh, I started it with two other co-founders about 18 years ago. Wow. Um, 18 years ago, this was, you know, Eileen, way before social media, way before online shopping became what it is today. Um, a couple of my friends and I came together because we wanted to sell our pre-loved clothes online for extra pocket money. So that was how it really started. And after a while of doing that, you know, uh, we were in school and we ran out of clothes to sell and, you know, we decided, okay, why don't we use the money that we had saved to import clothes from overseas to sell it to women? Because people kept coming back for more. They wanted, uh, I think it was the novelty or the excitement of purchasing something online and receiving maybe like five days later that really excited them too. So that was how it started. And after a while of doing that, you know, I realized that, hey, there's something missing in the market that were in. Um, a lot of international brands that were coming into the market, you know, were um, were primarily catering to the Western women, like your Zara, H&M, Mango, Topshop, um, Forever 21. So in my final year of university with no fashion, no business background, decided to drop out of school to start the cold start the business proper. And that was how Le Bonito was born. Really, you know, um, meet, wanting to meet the need um, for the Asian women, especially in the fashion world. Amazing. I have so many questions. Okay. So first of all, um, was it just local when you were running that, the first version of your shop, like local to Singapore? Yeah, it was, it was primarily local. Although every now and then we get customers from like Malaysia, Indonesia and things like that. But yeah, it was primarily majority local. And then with your co-founders, when you officially started Love Bonito, like what was your role and what were their roles? By the way, entrepreneurship back then isn't a word at all. When we first started, it was just us coming together for fun, right? It was more like a passion project. Uh, we never, we, I think for me, one of the biggest lessons, I wasn't the intentional in understanding, okay, what clear specific each other's strengths are, what the clear division of scope is. It was just all coming together, you know, having fun together. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think in that sense, you know, um, back then we didn't really like have clearly defined scopes when we first started. So it was just us coming together, wanting to do something together. And and there was that. Yeah. So, okay, that makes sense because it's just like friends coming together. But was there like an area that you were like the best at or that you enjoyed doing the most? What was that? Uh, what I really enjoyed was 
I think the customer, like talking to customers, like the community side of things, I've always enjoyed speaking to people, getting to know them, you know, asking them questions, learning more about, you know, uh, what they're saying, what they're not. And I think that's something that has intrigued me a lot, which then helps me better able to, you know, be able to tra- translate that to the products that we create, the experiences that we create for them. Uh, I, I also really enjoy the marketing side of things. Um, and I think back then marketing is also so different from what it is today, but basically more storytelling, right? I think that's something that has uh, really resonated with me all these years. Amazing. How did you start to market the brand in the beginning? Like, was it, I don't know, what kind of things did you do and how did it like catch on? I'm not sure if you remember back then, it was a lot of blogging, right? And yes. primarily like... And the I live- loved fashion blogs back then. I know. I was so into it. Yeah. yeah. And because we were the pioneers, especially in Singapore, in online shopping, I think we needed to do a lot more than just have a digital space or digital shop. We needed to gain the trust of people because people back then were not used to just wiring money to a stranger and then ex- and, 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 and trusting that their, their products would be delivered. So we needed to have that personal space, which is via our blogs, to be able to put a face to the brand, you know, to, to, to help mm-hmm. people understand that, hey, these women are real, this brand is real, these are the women behind the brand, you know. We also share a lot about our lives, you know, um, what we're wearing, what we're excited by, what we're doing this weekend and things like that. So I think that was how we also gained the trust back then, which was really important. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. It's like, it was so new back then. People weren't really online like they do now. Exactly. Was this always your dream to start a company or to be in fashion? Like, you know, before you started the company, what were you working towards? Back then, especially, it's an entrepreneurship or starting your own business, especially at such a young age, is unheard of. Plus, mm-hmm. being a woman, you know, I, yeah. I think we had it. We, we had it tougher then because we were so young, we were women and people didn't really take us seriously also, you know, in the, in the business world. So for me, I've always wanted to be in a space where I could interact a lot with people, have the opportunity to be able to, you know, um, whether is it like inspire or impact them in some form, right? So I was working towards becoming a teacher ex- actually, you know, oh. and that was something that I really enjoyed. Yeah. And I still, I still do enjoy the aspect of, you know, being around people and, and things like that. So for me, that was what I was working towards and never, never ever dreamt that, you know, uh, I would co-start or co-found a business, be a business owner and things like that. So it really happened organically along the way when the the, part, the pieces of the puzzle started to fit and I realized that, hey, this is an opportunity that I wanted to try. Um, why not? You know, and I think the tricky thing, Eileen, is that because back then I had to drop out of university to start the business with my co-founders and because I was bonded to the government, I had to pay off a five-figure sum to the government uh, to break my bond and obviously I didn't have the amount of money and that was a year of financial crisis my my dad was already going through bankruptcy my mom was already working two jobs to support the family so it was a really difficult time for us Um, and I remember you know I had no choice but to go to my mom to convince her to to loan me that sum of money and she was so worried because Online shopping was so new and she was asking me, is what you're doing legal? Will the authorities come (laughs) after you? You know, it was that scary. But I am so grateful that she chose to take that leap of faith. And for me, it's more like, you know, I have tested and tried and built momentum along the way, you know, through smaller mm-hmm. risks and smaller experiments. And I knew that if I were to invest more time, more effort, more attention, more energy and resources into the business, there's a good chance that it would work out. So that was how it also gave me that confidence to take that risk. And I think at, at the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, I was too young then. If this were to fail, I can always go back to studying. So I think that was also what gave me the courage to pursue this um, adventure. 
That's amazing. I mean, it's not easy to do. It takes a lot of courage to do that. I mean, what were the things that gave you confidence? Like, was it because you were already like making sales and sort of thing? Yeah. I think for me, there is one concept by Jim Collins that I really, one principle that I hold true to until today, even in business or in life. And that is before we fire the cannonball, we fire bullets. So we fire bullets first to test, right? smaller scale risks and experiments to see, okay, before I fire the cannonball, you know, what's it going to take to work? You know, for us in Love Bonito, so for, for example, we started off prime, we started off online, you know, and for us also to really understand that, hey, um, before I invest in a full-fledged physical store, it's a huge investment with huge risks for me to then understand, okay, what is it going to take um, for us? Like, what's the store size? What's the, the, the which, which location should we open in? You know, what assortment should we bring down? So we tested via pop-up stores, which was us firing bullets to test and see, you know, what would work before having that confidence to open a fully-fledged um, physical store. So for me, it was like testing and trying on the site um, before deciding to drop everything and go all in in the business. That's so smart. I love that. That's such a good quote. Okay. Um, clearly you, there's a whole journey of like building it from the beginning to what it is now. What were the major, I guess, I guess, major evolutions of Love Bonito? Like looking back in your history. Yeah. Well, cause I'm sure there's different eras. Yeah, there <laughs> are, your life. especially, you yeah. know, it's been 18 years, 18 <laughs> years and officially 13 years. Um, I think, I think there were there were quite a number. There were a couple of really key, you know, turning points in Love Bonito's journey. And one of which was when we first started, our mission was really like sharing the love of fashion. That was what we wanted to do, you know. And along the way, it evolved to it crystallized, it crystallized and evolved to becoming, you know, being able to empower women through fashion. And I think that's something that is a huge involvement and a turning point for us. I think I remember in 2013, you know, there was a customer that came uh, who wrote in to me and she said, hey, Rach, can I come down to share with you a little bit more about how Love Bonito has made an impact in my life? And I mean, actually, that was the time where I was going through a really down time in my journey. I was jaded. I was tired. I was thinking to myself, okay, is this worth it? You know, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner has so much pressure, so much stress. You're not just working Mondays to Fridays, nine to five. You're working 24 seven. You never stop worrying, you know. And, and back then I was also thinking, okay, why does Love Bonito exist? What is its purpose at the end of the day? If we were to close down, Will it really matter to customers? And the email came in at a very timely um, season. So I invited her down to my office and she's this lady in her mid-20s. And I remember, you know, as she walked into my office, she was primarily moving on the entire right side of her body because her entire left side was immobile. You could also tell that she had just shaved off her head. So as she sat down, she told me, you know, Rach, for the last six months, I had been in and out of major surgery. Uh, I had to go through skull reconstruction because there was sitting something sitting on the left nerve of my brain. And basically, I lost everything, my crown of glory, my confidence, everything. And throughout my recovery journey, I choose to put on a piece of Love Bonito clothing every day because it gives me the courage to look at myself in the mirror to face the world when I needed to go back to medical checkups, when I needed to go back to job interviews. So that was what it was wow. for me. And it clicked back then that, oh my God, this is why you guys do what you do. This is why you pay so much attention to the products. This is why you're not just creating clothing for the sake of. This is why... Every clothing to us is like an armor that we send mm. off to, you know, believe that it would make a difference in a woman's lives. We believe in La Bonito that when you look good, you feel good. It's not just superficial. You stand a little taller, you speak a little louder, and you shine a little brighter. And that's that 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 at the end of the day is what drives us to you know, wanting to do better for our customers. So I think that was one of the key turning points for us, like realizing our mission, our purpose, and that, that greater um, purpose at the end of the day as to why we exist in this world. That's such a beautiful story. 
Wow. It's so moving. And I, I love your mission so much. It's true. Like clothes are not just superficial, but it, it's, it empowers the person that wears it and it means so much more. Wow. Um, so what do you believe were the keys to your success then along the way as you were growing the business in all those different phases? Yeah, I think there are so many different factors, right? But I think one thing is people, team. I think we are nothing without the team. Um, first and foremost, I truly believe that in every stage of a business, um, we require different types of people. And I think as a leader, it's so important to recognize what stage of the business that you're in, what types of people that you need to bring on board. And as you, as a business, continue to switch gears through the journeys, it's so important to also then realize, okay, you know, what replacements do you need? You know, what new breed do you need? And and I think that's something that as a leader, we, it's so important to be able to recognize uh, and then also knowing your own strengths so that you hire people smarter than you in different areas to do this with you and to complement you. I really believe that, you know, all of us have a different superpower at the end of the day. We're all gifted differently. And for me, it's really the ability to also then recognize areas that, you know, I'm really not great at and how can I also, as especially at the right time, bring the right people on board with me. So I think for me, people and team is key. And then secondly, I really believe in this quote by John Maxwell, where he says, everything rises and falls on leadership. And that is huge because I think that spoke to me so much and that also is one of the reasons why it encouraged me so much to continuously learn grow, improve, get better throughout my entire 18 years of the journey. Because I think if you want better, if you want a better organization, you need better people. If you want better people, you need better leaders. And if you want to attract better talents, you need to be better yourself, right? So for me, I've always believed that, okay, if you're a level five leader, you're going to attract the level four, level three talents. If you're a level 10 leader, you're going to attract the level nine, level 11 leaders. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's that drive uh, and to continuously grow, get better, expand my mind, you know. And I think that is also how we how we as an entire organization can get better and can attract better people too. So I think these are key things along the way. Yeah. Yeah, those are really big. Thank you for sharing. And I can tell that, you, like you said, you love to learn and you love to grow because obviously you didn't really like study this. Like you didn't. <laughs> so you, I can tell that you're such a confident leader and obviously you've built the business to this point. How It took me a long time. You know, when I just started, I, I also, besides having no education or no experience in, um, Lead a business in the business world, leadership world. I've also never worked under anyone in that sense, besides, of course, my part time odd jobs as a waitress, as a salesperson. But I've never really experienced what a good leader is, what a bad leader is. So I've had to learn along the way. And back when mm -hmm. I first started as a young leader, Back then, it was a time where the media were glam the media was glamorizing leaders like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, and for me, I thought that okay. This is a definition of a good leader. In order to be good, I need to be exactly like them. I need to look like them. I need to sound like them in that sense, right? And for me, I felt miserably and I hated myself every time at the end of the day and I felt so unnatural. And it wasn't until, you know, a period of like really questioning, yearning, lack of confidence, even wondering like, okay, am I meant to do this? Maybe leaders truly are born, they're not made. And maybe, you know, I, this is just, I've come to the end of, you know, my journey and destiny and I should just give up. Until one day in Love Bonito's journey, um, one thing that we do is strengths finders for our employees. And so I really believe in that. Where strengths finders test, it helps you to identify areas that you're inclined towards, that you have natural abilities and giftings in. And I think that for me opened up my eyes to like, wow. Firstly, when I first did it, when the results came out, I was like, oh, why are my strengths, you know, why, why are they not, like better, why are they, and I wish and I covered it so much more of what everyone else had. And I was really, you know, complaining. And after that, one of my colleagues, I remember she, she came and she told me, hey, Rach, actually what you have is not what all of us have. And as cliche as it sounds, it really hit me then and then. And I was thinking to myself, wow, okay. Then in this case, I'm just going to look at what I have. I'm not going to belittle it. 
I'm not gonna compare myself to others. I'm just gonna accept it and embrace it and work on it. And I'm also going to learn more about it. So I started reading up more about my strengths, learning more about it. And what I think, were your strengths in from Strengths Finder? Yeah, I think it's you know. Things like, you know, the ability to win people over, like really being mm. very, the ability to be so persuasive, um, ah, positivity it's like comes. like soft skills. Yeah. yeah. Positivity mm-hmm. comes naturally for me. It's something yep. that, you know, I am. And individualism is something, for example, I can see people individually for who they are and, and what they are and their strengths and things like that. So it's a lot on the softer skill side. And for me, I was wondering, oh, where are all my hard skills, you know? And <laughs> That was, but, but it's also then I started to embrace and learn that, okay, you know, interesting. If this is what I have, I'm going to read up individually. So I bought tons of books on it, read up. I listened to all the YouTube videos and podcast episodes on, 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 on this topic. And I slowly learned, practiced, tried, and I became more confident because I started to see the unique impact and difference that I was making. And I think it really reminded me at the end of the day that, hey, all of us are created so uniquely different. And I think for me, it's really, my job is to be able to be responsible for my gifts and talents, grow it, hone it, become even better at them, and then Mm -hmm. work with people who are differently abled from me, you know, surround myself with them, and together we make a really strong team. So it took me a long while to get to where I am in that sense where today I accept my strengths, I accept who I am, I embrace them. And I am also, you know, honing my skills and learning to become even better than what I'm naturally at. And I have no qualms about my weaknesses also and learning to intentionally surround myself with people smarter than me. And I think that has been a huge, you know, light switch on for me in my journey. Like, wow, I've wasted so much of my time crying, belittling myself, you know, wishing I was so much more. Uh, and I think that has that has helped me tremendously in my personal and professional journey. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's funny how we always wish we were something else, but you fail to recognize like you have so much gift, like you have a strength that you have to learn to hone. Yeah. I mean, so many like great nuggets and so many more questions come to my mind. I One other thing that you talk about is like, it's so important to have a good team. So what are the tips you can give to other people who are trying to build a team? Like, how do you find the, the people that you want to work with? That's a great question, Eileen. And I think at the end of the day, it really boils down to finding people who would, you know, come on board to journey with you and build whatever that you want to build or, you know, drive this mission and fulfill this mission with you. I would say, number one, it really starts with ourselves. You really have to understand and take a lot of time to be intentional. And it's not just a one-day affair. This is an ongoing journey that even for myself, I'm still constantly practicing and learning. I have to dig deep to ask myself, okay, what are first thing my values and principles, right? Because I think these are things that are non-negotiable. For me, I would never want to hire or work with someone that have very different principles and alignment in values with me. And I think that is the foundation for a lot of issues that will come along the way. So I think for me, it's really understanding, okay, what my values and principles are, what my temperament is, what are my natural strengths and weaknesses. Because then from then I know what kind of people I need to bring on board with me. Uh, It's it's so important because I think at the end of the day, you know, beyond chemistry, beyond anything, I think that it's really so important to be able to bring on board the right people that can complement you, uh, yet have the exact same, you know, are bond your and you guys are bonded by that value and that mission and the alignment and principles together. And I think that's something that's so important. Number two, I think you know once you have gotten to know yourself and then what you need in order to complement you or to build a strong an even stronger team. I think number two, it's really important to them be able to articulate your vision, your mission, your goals. And I think this is something that you really have to practice. I practice so much by talking to people, by refining, you know, um, what I want to say. Um, it's really almost like, you know, the elevator pitch that you need. Like you only sometimes have 15 seconds to get someone's attention. You only have 15 seconds to be able to win someone over. What are you going to say? Especially in a world that is so competitive today, you know, um, 
uh, especially in, 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 in the work world, it's so competitive today. How are you going to stand out and attract the best talent for yourself at this stage of your business? I think that's something that's so important. Number three, I think word of mouth is something that has driven a lot of um, great referrals for us uh, as a business or as a team, right? I think it's so important to uphold what you say, right? You need to practice what you preach because it gets around. People would recommend you or people would not recommend you depending on the interactions with you also. So I think that's something that is so important at the end of the day. You really need to be able to practice what you preach because I think at the end of the day, word of mouth goes around and a lot of the times, great talents come also because they hear that, oh, it's a great company to work for or, oh, this leader, she practices what she preaches or she really goes down into developing people, which is what my next point is, culture. I think it, what, the culture that you build is going to be so key. Today, most of us, we're not just looking for the highest paying job. We're also looking for a place, you know, where my leader or my company, my organization will believe in me, give me the opportunities and help me develop and grow into what I want to become, into areas that I want to pursue. And I think that is something that is so important as an organization. It's not just about getting and extracting as much value out of your people, but what in return can you give back to them in terms of like opportunities, great feedback or great coaching, uh, great coaching um, moments to be able to help them to grow as well. So I think all of these things together are going to be so important when it comes to attracting and building a great team. Yeah, definitely. Um, back to your ability to like learn and grow on your own. What is like, how did you incorporate that learning and growing in your journey? Like you seem like you read a lot of books, but how do you, you know, I want to know what it looked like. Did you were you reading a lot while building the business? Like, do you have a routine, you know? Yeah, I love reading. And, and, and reading was one of my first forms of learning and growing. Because I think like through the books that I read, the business book, the autobiographies, the self-help books, I learned so much from people's experiences and I got to learn so much from the experts. And it gave it expanded my mind to so much more, like different perspectives, different ways of doing things. And I think for me, that was the quickest way to download and to be able to, you know, cheat through learning from people's experiences. Right. And I think that was so instrumental in my and is still a very instrumental way in my personal growth and development journey. I I am obsessed with learning through books, right? And um and I did, and I think that is something that has really helped me tremendously in my growth journey. Um other ways of learning, I think for me it's um I think it starts with also like, you know, having a very curious mind um and having a growth mindset and believing at the end of the day that our trajectory of life can be changed if we want to. If you are not happy with where you are today, you can change it. If you want to become better, you can become better. And I think there is so much, we have so much control in how our life would turn out. And I think that is something that really inspires me to continuously learn in different aspects of my life, not just in business, but like, mental, emotional health, right? I think these are areas that are also ultimately so important in our journey, whether as an entrepreneur, whether as a business owner, whether as a leader, just as a person, like being able to take control of our mental, emotional health, understanding it, you know, learning how to regulate, learning how to recognize triggers and learning how to understand triggers, for example. I think things like that are so important. Um, and I think so then like listening to podcasts, um, or like attending causes, physical causes, going for retreats, you know, I think all of these things have helped me tremendously also. And then, of course, it comes to speaking to different people uh, who have gone before me, uh, like my mentors, and then also reverse mentorship, speaking to people younger than me. And I'm so intrigued by the Gen Zs and how they think about things, why they're so interested or why they're so attracted by certain other things. So I think that helps me generally as a whole, you know. Um, I, you know, it's so interesting, I think I was speaking to um, one of the most prestigious leadership coaching companies globally. And I was speaking to one of um, the directors and I was just asking her, hey, Linda, 
Ia, you have personally coached and spoken to so many top leaders globally. And we're, just, we're not just talking about the Fortune 500 leaders. We're talking about the greatest startups, tech leaders um, throughout maybe the last two decades. And I was asking her, is there, is there one characteristic that you see, the common thread that you see among each of them? And she told me, oh, yes, for sure. They're all curious. And I think that was something that reinforced like, wow, you know, like we can learn from any instance that we want to learn. Not just through like books, talking to someone older than us. No, we can learn from anyone, everyone. And I think that is something that, you know, for me is so important to like even like constantly ask why or like ask the right questions, you know, don't settle or like, be or I'll challenge myself to think about to think again about a certain concept or principle that I thought was true, you know, and I think that has helped me also tremendously in my journey. Wow, yeah, I can attest to that. It's like being curious is so important. Um, okay, so what have been the biggest challenges that you had to overcome in your journey? I know it's a big question, but like, what is there something? I guess was there a big mountain that you consider your mountain that you had to climb? Well, Eileen, I would always say that the mountain is me. I am my own mountain. And I think for my entire journey, the biggest obstacle I've always had to overcome is myself. My self-doubts, my insecurities, my ego, my pride, my... And, and things like that. My, you know, And I think being able to address all of them throughout different phases of my journey has been so crucial in me being able to grow, overcome and get stronger. I think we all face setbacks and failures. That's for sure. We all face obstacles, challenges, but it's how you choose to overcome them or how you choose to approach them. I think, you know, for, for a large part of myself, it's also like remembering that, hey, it's not it's not about you at the end of the day, right? And how can I get over myself, get over comparing with others, you know, get over my insecurities of like wanting to be liked, you know, wanting to please people and, you know, not being able to um, put forth a certain, for example, feedback or an opinion just because I was f afraid of offending someone. And I think all of these things I have, I've had to work through, working through my triggers, right? Like, oh, why was it that when, when, when someone said something, it triggered me, it, it made me feel flustered, you know, I was angry. And, I, when I, and as I peel back the layers and reflect, I realized that, oh, it was because, wow, she said something that hurt my ego. Now, how can I then, you know, not have such an easily bruised ego? How can I be stronger? How? And it's all of these things that, you know, Basically, that's why I say the mountain is me because learning how to get over myself at each time and, and also then realizing at the end of the day that there's a lot of things that we can't control. Life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we respond. Mm -hmm. So when something terrible happens or when someone says something, I can choose how I want to respond. I can choose the perspective that I want to take out of it. I always believe that, you know, what happens to us are neutral events. But it is, mm. it is the stories that we tell ourselves in our minds about it that make it yep. negative or positive. So for me, that same amount of energy might as well, you know, be able to make it positive and do something good about it. I think along the way, I've also had to learn really to regulate, you know, um, so many times in life, in business, you know, there are so many ups and downs. And for a long time, whenever the business goes through a high, oh, I'm emotionally high. When when it, it fails or there's a setback, I crash along with it. And so my life has always been like so erratic in that sense. And I find myself like, oh my God, this is too much for me. It's like, oh, I'm going to get a heart attack anytime. <laughs> and I've had to learn how to become have more equanimity in my life, you know? And that means that, okay, whenever something happens, whenever something bad happens, when a failure happens, when a setback happens, when I feel that something, how can I, well, you know, give my chance, give myself the chance to mourn over it, cry over it, but not get sucked into it, right? So what I do is I give myself a time limit. When something bad happens, depending on the magnitude, when I'm hurt by something, I set a time limit, okay, 
This is 30 minutes, for example, I'm going to go to a corner, I'm going to cry, I'm going to replay the scene in my head, I'm going to be upset, I'm going to beat myself, I'm going to blame the whole world. But when when my phone rings, when the, when the alarm comes on, I'm going to have to snooze a couple of times, but then I'm going to have to <laughs> force myself to get up and get out of it mentally, mm. emotionally, and physically. And I find yeah. that that helps me because... Instead of sweeping it under the carpet and not addressing it, because then it will creep up in some form later. Instead of that, I, I, I gave it the time of day to mourn over it, to throw it its funeral, to cry over it, to address it, you know. And I find that that for me is a healthier way to move on. Yet at the same time, not, not dwelling in it for too long and being sucked by it and, or being crippled. Or, 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 yeah, but or, or being crippled by that negative emotion. So, little things like that along the way that I've really had to learn to get over myself. Um, that that's really that that is my biggest mountain. Yeah, no, that's a great tip that anyone can implement. And then with you working through your own self, like that work of like overcoming self doubt and stuff. What are the tools that help you do that? Do you journal, or how, how do you work through things personally? And I think it differs for everyone, you know. I think for me, I I am an expressive person, so I talk through it a lot with my coach, my my life coach, my therapist. I talk through it because then it helps me reflect back what I'm saying, and I get a clear, I get more clarity on. Oh my gosh, wow! So this is what I'm really thinking. Okay, now what can I do about it? And it helps. It gives me so much more perspective and wisdom around it. And number two, I journal. I write out, you know, what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling. And I just basically, it's just like a verbal written dump on like what I'm going through. And when I look back, I also realize that, wow, okay, I definitely am getting stronger because like I find myself being able to pick myself up emotionally a lot quicker because I believe it's like a muscle at the end of the day, right? The more we work at it, the more we flex it, the stronger we become mentally and emotionally. So I journal a lot and I also like talk to professionals like my, my coach or my, my therapist a lot. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. It's, I, I understand that that can help you so much, like talking to someone, like, cause when you talk to a therapist, like hearing yourself say the story again, you're, you're process, processing it in a new way than when you're experiencing it or when you're talking to yourself in your head. Exactly right. And also because then they are also trained, of course, to then probe and uncover more layers to ask you great questions, you know? And I think what I love about it is that it's a safe space. There is no judgment. I don't have to feel like I'm withholding something. And I think that is so important and what we need in life. Mm. What is something that you didn't expect from achieving success? Like, has there been anything unexpected or something that most people don't realize? Because I think a lot of people look at you, they're like, wow, she has it all. She's I don't. This company. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. What do you have to say? I think, um, firstly, I, I'm not sure if I have achieved success, but I think, okay, to be fair, I think I've built together with my team and my co-founders, mm-hmm. we have built, you know, a relatively, um, successful business. Um, and I would say what pe- most people don't see is it's really like this visual of, you know, the iceberg and then the ocean sea level, right? Where most of us see the tip, but below there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I think a lot of people don't see the sacrifices, um, the tears shed, the blood shed that goes on behind all of that. I think it takes an immense amount of discipline, commitment, consistency to be able to, I wouldn't even want to use the word successful, to be stronger, right? And to be better. And I think a lot of people sometimes, especially today, and I'm guilty of it sometimes myself, like, oh, what's the quickest way that I can get there? Instead of 10 steps, how can I get there in one step, you know? And I think we be, we, we, we are so impatient today that we, sometimes even for myself, I want to quicken the process. I don't want to do the work. I don't want to sweat. I just want to enjoy the results. But I think at the end of the day, I remind myself, it's not about the destination, it's really about the journey at the end of the day and the process of getting there that teaches us so much, that refines my character, that refines my habits, that refines basically all of me inside. You know, And I think that is something that most people don't see. 
um, they see the glamorous side, the successful side, um, but they really don't see the other side, which is why, Alina, I'm so passionate about coming out to share very openly about my struggles, my failures, my disappointments, my lessons, be it at work, in my marriage, you know, in my personal life. And I also really want people to be able to know that, you know, oh my God, I I don't have it all at all. I actually am learning. I have dropped many pieces before and, you know, and, and things like that. And I really want to come out to share, like at least for me, the thought process to how I can improve and become better. And I think at the end of the day, we are all shared by this common commonality that we all go through in life, that we struggle. We all struggle, be it mentally, emotionally, in our lives and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's how we also come together to try and overcome it. And I think there is so much power that lies within us that sometimes we forget. We just take the easy way out by thinking, oh, of course she has it easy, right? Uh, you know, she has all the luck in the world. She has everything set up for her or whatever, you know? And I find myself also sometimes thinking that, but actually I realized that there is so much more that goes on behind a person's success or achievements. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own struggle, even if it looks amazing on the outside. 100%, yeah. Yep, yep. So can you walk us through your life on a typical day or week? What are you doing? How, you know, what is your schedule like? You must be so busy. I think it's, um, it changes very often and through different seasons. So right now, you know, I am a new mom. My son, he's three years old. Um, so every morning I try to wake up before he does. So just so that I have some quiet time and peace to myself because I realize that when I wake up, at the same time that he wakes up, oh my God, I'm just thrown into that whole mode where I'm <laughs> flustered. I'm, you know, just needing to attend to all of his needs. And after that, I realized that, oh my God, my day is so, you know, the, the start of my day is already uh, so hectic, you know, and messy in that sense. So I try to give myself at least 30 minutes of peace where I just do some breathing exercises, meditation of some form and mentally prepping my mind of, okay, what what is the day going to be like? How do I want it to be? What do I want to achieve? Um, so I wake up about maybe 6.30 to be able to do that. Uh, and then after that, my son wakes up shortly after. And then, you know, I we prepare him for school. And after that, my husband and I send him off to school. Sometimes if our meetings don't start too early, we go for a nice breakfast where we just chat, catch up. And that's such precious time alone. And then after that, the day begins, you know, I try to then go to my emails, to respond to everything before, you know, um, the workday truly begins. So I think for me, after that, you know, once it hits nine or 10, all the way it's like meetings, um, being with the team or being in office three days a week, for example, um, attending to work, you know, firefighting and things like that. Yeah, I try my very best to come home by evening so that I can at least, you know, put my son to sleep. Uh, and after that, I have dinner, whether is it going out with my friends or have dinner with my husband at home. And after that, it's just slowly unwinding for the night. Uh, I love to read or listen to podcasts before I sleep. Uh, but in the morning while getting ready to or while commuting, I listen to a lot to podcasts. I think it primes my mind and it feeds my mind. So at the end of the day, I just lie in bed and just slowly unwind and then it's a new day again. So it's actually quite not that like interesting, but yeah, I think this is like like the general flow of how my day goes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then how do you prioritize your time and what you focus on? in terms of like work and being productive? I think I would try as much as I can to always be as productive in everything that I do, especially now because like being a mom, I want to ensure that when I'm at work, I truly fulfill as much as I can so that I can, you know, ensure that I can go back by the evening. And also then when I'm with Ollie, my son in the evening at night, I don't worry too much or I want to make sure that I don't have to worry too much about, okay, what's outstanding at work and things like that. So I think that's something that's very important for me. I think in general, when we talk about prioritization in life, it's just something that I'm learning a lot about. Um, for 18 years of my life, I have dedicated or, com or, or, or committed it to, you know, growing Love Bonito with my team. And 
now with you know the extra elements of like a kid you know a marriage and things there's like a that. lot to juggle for you it can be very tricky uh where for me it's easier to go back to work mode because that's what I've been so used to but also reminding myself that wow these are important aspects of my life that I cannot afford to drop or lose you know I always uh, I always go back to this analogy where you know we wear so many well multifaceted women and we wear so many hats we have so many different roles in lives so many different responsibilities and we juggle so many balls some of the balls in the different seasons of our life are made of rubber where you can afford to drop them temporarily and it will be okay it will still be the same like not it wouldn't break but some of the balls are made of glass where if you drop them it would shatter and it would never be the same and i think that is a constant reminder for me to you know mm-hmm. always go back to what's important what can i not afford to drop and even then you know like I'm so grateful for the support system that I have at home where there was a season last year where I really neglected my marriage and my husband and we were you know drifting in that sense where I was giving my 100% to work and I come back I was giving my 100% 100% to my son and at the end of the day I'm just so tired I have no energy left to talk I just want to like unwind close my eyes breathe and sleep and it it got to a period where it was prolonged and you know my husband he he was so desperate he didn't know how else to get to me he wrote me a whole long email you know mm. where he where it was titled a cry for help and he said yeah you know and it, it, in the email he expressed everything about how i had been uh, how he feels neglected you know and the marriage um it, it 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 we're drifting apart and things like that and how he has to know about like my new store openings through my company's LinkedIn page or things like that. And it really, really broke my heart because to me, that is not how I want my marriage to be. And then, and then, and then it was like a wake up call for me. Okay. You know what? If I can't trust myself to be able to, you know, spend time with him, uh, fluidly, I'm going to make sure that I make it rigid by putting in time in my calendar to set aside time where we both sit down, we catch up, we talk. We express, we listen, and I think that's something that has been very helpful, at least for me in recovering and reconnecting again. So I think, yeah, I think that's why I say, right, I don't have it all and I'm still learning and I'm still trying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so if you were to go back to when you were like early, like just starting the company, what is something you wish you knew or did differently? Is there anything? There are a lot, um, but I think one of the things I wish I knew much earlier on is I wish I had spent more time getting to know myself a lot more. My strengths, my weaknesses, my temperaments, my natural ability, what drives me, what drains me, and little things like that. Because for so long, I realized that for a large part of my journey, I was just constantly comparing myself to others, wishing I was someone else, trying to be someone I wasn't. And I realized that the sooner I was in really understanding deeply myself, accepting myself, embracing myself, and then working on being the best version of myself, that was when I slowly became more confident in who I was. And that was when I slowly saw the real difference that I was making in the people around me. And I wish that I had done that a lot sooner. Okay. So if you were to give advice to people who are young and they want to start a business, is that the same advice you would give? Or would you say, what else would you say? I would say firstly that not everyone is meant to start a business and it's okay, right? Firstly, I believe that entrepreneurship is over glamorized today. Um, Being an entrepreneur is not any greater than being a non-entrepreneur. I must say that if it wasn't for each and every team member that chose to journey with me to build Love Bonito, Love Bonito would definitely not be where it is today. And I think today, a lot of times, maybe some of us, the younger ones, we we want to be an entrepreneur or we want to start something just because it's cool, it's trendy, or, you know, or it's, it's the eat thing today. And I really want to be able to encourage us to think deeper. What is it that you're trying to solve or what is the need that you're trying to meet? And also to recognize like, you know, like 
what what are you like you know are you meant to be an entrepreneur are you meant to do something even greater than being an entrepreneur and i think that's something that's so important to recognize which is why for me being able to really truly know ourselves inside out is key yeah and i think secondly my next point is you know for young ones who want to start a business firstly and as firstly that was you know not everyone's meant to be an entrepreneur and it's okay secondly there is no age limit to being an entrepreneur I, my advice would actually be, you know, to come out to start and to learn from other people first, to work under different organizations, different leaders, to learn from them, learn how it's run, learn from their mistakes, learn from their successes. And I think that is so valuable for you. So I think this would be the two key main advices I would give. Amazing. Thank you. Um, okay. So what is your vision now, like for your life and for Love Bonito? Where do you hope to take it? I've always believed that Le Bonito is not just in the business of fashion, but ultimately in the business of women. And that is what I'm so passionate about. You know, how can we, um, as a team, build an ecosystem to be able to impact women, empower her through the different stages of her life beyond fashion? Fashion is a huge aspect, but beyond that, we want to be able to come alongside the woman to journey with her, to give her the courage to come into her own. For my own life, I think for me, it's, how can I also say, you know, likewise, have the courage to become the highest, truest expression of myself? And I think for me, it's, you know, constantly also, for 18 years of my life, I have been known as the co-founder of Love Bonito, where that's my identity. But if you were to strip that away from me one day, will I know who I really am? Will I be okay if you take everything else away from me, my title, my achievement, And I think that is something that, you know, I really want to work towards, you know, constantly also evolving and yeah, moving maybe to a new chapter also beyond, you know, Love Bonito, especially as I continue to have people smarter than me in the business run the business, right? I think for me, I'm very curious to also see, you know, what, what's, what lies ahead for me. Yeah. That was going to be my next question is like, what's next for you and what are you excited about now? Like, do you have an idea or are you just open? For me, we always have an idea. It's whether or not you want to take the time to tune into that still small voice. And for for maybe a long time, I have been avoiding it because I was afraid that, you know, okay, I was afraid of confronting it that, okay, you know, that if I were to know that maybe I'm called towards another adventure or something else, right? That I would have to face my fears and do it. And I think for me, what I've been noticing is also like, yeah, just constantly, like what I shared earlier from the very beginning, what I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to people, drawn to communities, drawn to like being able to um, make an impact uh, with the community of people. So I think for me, just slowly also, you know, tuning into this still small voice and being able to be open and trying new things. And for me, again, firing bullets, testing it out, trying it. So I think that for me, it's just, yeah, interesting for me to see. I don't have the answer now. Um, But yeah, it's just something I'm very open to exploring. Yeah, because I think you know your purpose in a sense. It's bigger than just Love Bonito, right? Like you have a gift that can, like Love Bonito is like one version, one expression of your gift. But there's so much more that can be, you can be more than that. Yeah. And I think like for me, Le Bonito is great and I'm so excited by its future. But I think also like, I think my role as a founder evolves tremendously through the years, right? And I think, especially now, like I shared, like there's like people much smarter than me in different areas running the business. Then how can I further then use my gifts to contribute, whether is it within Le Bonito or outside of Le Bonito? What what's the role that you play now in Love Bonito? Like, have you taken a step back or are you still very hands-on? I'm still very hands-on, especially in the day-to-day, but in particular, like more specific to areas like the product design, you know, building a community, storytelling. I think these are things that I would always be so passionate about that I can, you know, in some form value add to the team. I've all, you know, through the years also taken myself out of areas where I'm not needed where of course, you know, there are people who can do a much better job than I can than I ever will. And I think these are areas that I've also let go. But I think for me, then using my gifts, holding my gifts to be able to contribute in this area. So I think that is something that still excites me a lot today. Yeah. 
Yeah. Cause like you still want to do what you're interested in and what you're good at. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, this is just a brand, the marketing question is like, what do you think makes your brand successful with your community? I think it's that we are authentic. And I think being around for the last almost two decades, right? People can suss out, especially today, if you say something, but you don't mean it. And I'm not saying that we're perfect. I think along the way, we're also learning, you know, um, to be able to relate to a customer more, be even more authentic. And I think one of the key things is that I think people can sense, firstly, that our products deliver. And I think on a very basic level, you need to be able to ensure that you deliver on the promise of your products, right? And secondly, then your brand has to stand for so much more than its products, right? It can't just be a laptop. It can't just be a piece of item clothing, right? It has to be so much more. What are you representing? Apple, Mm -hmm. they represent creativity. Love Bonito, we represent confidence, right? And things like Mm -hmm. that. So I think it's being able to, yeah, represent ourselves so much more than our products that have also, you know, kept us um, at the top of our game. And I think it's that number, number, number three, I think is also that, that, that obsession and deep curiosity about our customers. We are constantly so curious about them, you know, what's interesting, what's interesting to them, you know, what are they engaged by and things like that. So I think that helps us further in being able to do more for our customers. Yeah. I mean, fashion and social media is such an ever-changing, fast-paced industry. So, so how do you keep up? Like, is it because you're, you're like, you prioritize like learning about your customer? I think it's, it really helps that we are a bunch of real women creating for other real women. So we are our customers. So we completely understand, okay, the trends have changed. Trends, not just in fashion trends, but even consumer trends, right? I think it's so different today versus even two years ago. So I think it was easier in that sense to be able to understand and, and adapt to also the rest of our customers, right? That's why I really believe that you should only, I, I, I believe, and, I'm, and, and not everyone would agree, but I believe that you should only start and do something that you yourself are truly passionate about, that you yourself are your own customer, because that makes all the difference at the end of the day. Yep, yep. All right. Um, Rach, you shared so many amazing tips today. I feel like there's so many like clips that we could feature because you said like every answer was so good. Um, The last question I have for you is if you were to leave one final message to our audience today, what would it be? Maybe two things. The biggest investment that we can make in life is in ourselves. And a lot of the times, even for me, I was I was asking myself, the younger me, I would have no qualms spending on a material good or anything else. But when it comes to investing or spending on like a coach, a course, a retreat or whatever to develop and grow myself further, I hesitate and write it off because it's too expensive. But I realized at the end of the day that investing in myself, that I carry with me these lessons that I will forever bring with me for the rest of my life. And I think that is one thing that I got wrong, you know, like I was okay, no qualms spending on material goods, but when it comes to spending on investing in myself, whatever it may be, yoga classes, whatever, coaching coaching classes, the therapy, I hesitated. But then I realized that I got it the other way around. So invest in yourself because that is the greatest reward that you can ever have in your life that you would carry through for generations and you would definitely have an impact in the people around through that. Number two, I think there is we have so much more control of our life than we think we do. A lot of the times when something bad happens, when I get upset, when I find that I'm in an environment where I can't control and I start to blame the world, I start to blame everything and I victimize myself. And that's when I realize that I'm losing and shrinking, shrink, shrinking responsibility to everything else but myself. And then I realized that I can turn it all around by reframing my mind, reframing my thoughts and everything, right? Like, for example, you know, one of the reframes that has been so powerful for me is changing from I have to do this to I get to do this. So when I find myself so stressed, so angry, like, why do I have to come back to cook for Ollie? 
oh, why do I have to come back to, you know, why do I have to stay with my in-laws? Or why do I have to go for these back-to-back meetings and change it to, I get to come back to to cook for Ollie. I get to stay with my in-laws. I get to attend these back-to-back meetings. It really changes everything for us. So just a simple reframe like that can turn things around for us and you realize that it makes all the difference at the end of the day. So I think there's so much more that I can share, but I really think that these are just the two that come to my mind right now. Like invest in yourself and you will get the greatest rewards through investing in yourself. And number two, you know, take control of your life. Life is truly 10% what happens to us and 90% how we choose to respond. And that is where the greatest power in life lies in choosing how we want to respond. Amazing. Mic drop. (laughs) That was so good. You're so wise. I can tell how much you've read and how much you've learned and and absorbed in your life. Um, Rachel, where can we find you online? Oh, thank you. Um, for, for, thank you, Eileen, for this great conversation. Uh, You can find me on Instagram, um, at, at ms underscore rage at miss rage. Um, yeah, and, and that's where I will also post a lot of updates and sharing. So yeah. And you also have a podcast, right? Yes, I do. I just started a podcast also inspired by you and what you're doing. Um, it's called Rich Reflex, where I come, you know, to bring together different like conversations with thought leaders that have personally impacted me. I just really want to bring my community on this learning journey with me and hope that we continue to expand our minds, you know, uh, and be able to grow through life together. So, yeah. Amazing, everyone. I'll link everything down below. Thank you so much again for being on the podcast. I so enjoyed today. Me too. Thank you. And you have a great evening for yourself. Thank you.